China is dealing with a problem. Its three astronauts are stranded in space. The Chinese astronauts were scheduled to return to Earth after six months, but now their return capsule is damaged. The Chinese Space Agency is saying that it was struck by orbital debris. Our next story decoding this for you and also looking at the dangers when it comes to space travel posed by increasing amount of space debris. China's magnificent Tiangong Space Station, a technological marvel orbiting at over 27,000 kilometers per hour, has sustained a direct hit. The massive orbital outpost designed as a permanent home for celestial ambition was struck without warning. The blow came not from a hostile force, but from a silent, speeding bullet of space debris. A fragment of the orbital junk cloud that now encircles the Earth. The Shenzhou 20 crewed spacecraft was hit by tiny bits of space debris. The impact was severe enough to trigger immediate alerts, forcing engineers on the ground into a state of panic. Initial telemetry suggests the strike may have compromised the integrity of the crew's return vehicle, the only lifeline tethering them to Earth. The three astronauts, already six months into their mission, now face a chilling reality. They are stranded in orbit. Their only ride home may be critically damaged, jeopardizing their complex and dangerous re-entry through the atmosphere. The incident throws a harsh spotlight on the deadly problem of space debris. Earth is now enveloped in a rapidly expanding cloud of broken satellites, spent rocket stages and tools, hundreds of thousands of fragments, each traveling at hypersonic speeds, carrying the kinetic energy of a hand grenade. This isn't China's first scare. Just last year, a debris warning forced the same station to perform an evasive maneuver, narrowly avoiding disaster. Global space agencies have repeatedly sounded alarm bells. NASA, the European Space Agency, and private firms all warn of Kessler syndrome, a chain reaction of collisions that could make Earth orbit impassable for decades. For the trio aboard Tiangong, the nightmare is real. Their supply capsule launch, scheduled for next week, may now be delayed. Without it, food and oxygen supplies could run dangerously low. Engineers on the ground race against time to bring the crew back. Space the final frontier has turned into a battlefield of junk. Humanity is learning the hard way how fragile that frontier truly is. Dictionary has officially crowned its word of the year for 2025 and it's something that sounds like it was conceived at a coffee shop maybe uh, over a conversation between startup founders and uh, musicians. The word is vibe coding. You can now build an app just by describing it to AI. No semicolons, no stress, just you, your idea and the good vibes only approach to uh, programming. The term uh, was coined by OpenAI co-founder who says that it's about letting AI do the heavy lifting while creators forget the code even exists. The translation, you tell the bot what you want, like, hey, make me an app that plans my weekly meals and the AI starts building it. It's coding for the non-coders basically, creativity, for those curious and maybe just maybe the end of copy paste chaos of course it's not foolproof your dream app might come with a few quirky surprises but colin says the phrase perfectly captures how language and technology are vibing their way into our lives
France is still hunting for the suspects of the Louvre heist. Some suspects have been arrested, but the precious jewels are yet to be found. And now a glaring lapse has surfaced. The Louvre's deepest security flaw, it seems, a password which anyone can guess. Experts are saying passwords like 123456 still cost millions as hackers can easily break them. But in the heart of Paris, the world's most famous museum hid its secrets behind a simple password. Our next report telling you more. The world's biggest museum, housing jewels worth over $45 billion and visited by over 9 million visitors every year, it has an elaborate security system. But there is a simple problem, believe me. The password for the surveillance software is as simple as Louvre. The Louvre heist wasn't just a brazen daylight robbery, it was a textbook tale of security complacency colliding with high-tech failure. Investigators uncovered a jaw-dropping lapse. The museum's video surveillance system was locked behind the password Louvre. This glaring oversight, a single word easy enough for a casual guess, opened digital gates to a theft worth over $100 million. Social media erupted. Elon Musk's response was pointed and succinct one word, wow. France's Court of Auditors urged the Louvre Museum to speed up its security modernization plans as a priority. Everything related to the modernization, restoration, securing of the Louvre and the Louvre's infrastructure, we have spent half as much as the amount dedicated to acquisitions and exhibitions. That is, 80 million euros. Four suspects in the Louvre heist were arrested last week, including three believed to be members of the team of four that was filmed using a basket lift to reach the museum's window. They face preliminary charges of theft by an organized gang and criminal conspiracy. The jewels have not been recovered. switching focus for now. America is in a state of gridlock. A record government shutdown has now entered day 36 and the impact is only deepening, also frustrating. On Wednesday, the Federal Aviation Administration warned it may reduce flights at dozens of major airports as early as Friday if the lawmakers fail to end the shutdown. Now, just to put that in perspective for you, that's about 10% of U.S. air traffic. The FAA did not name specific airports, but the cuts are expected to hit America's 30 busiest hubs, including New York's three main airports, major terminals in Washington, D.C., Chicago, Atlanta, Phoenix, Seattle. In other words, this is not just a policy stalemate anymore. It's a national log jam. The FAA is saying it is considering the move to ease pressure on air traffic controllers, many of whom have been working without pay reportedly. The shutdown, now the longest in U.S. history, has forced 13,000 air traffic controllers, 50,000 TSA agents to work without salaries. Staff shortages have worsened. Flight delays have mounted. Some workers have taken second jobs reportedly just to survive. Others are calling in sick in protest. As a result, an aviation system on the brink in a way. The federal government has been partially shut since October 1. Because Republicans and Democrats cannot seem to find a way out. They are deadlocked over a funding bill. Democrats insisting that any agreement must extend health insurance subsidies. But Republicans refuse to agree. The standoff has left 750,000 federal employees furloughed. 
cut food assistance for low-income families, close doors on essential public services. And now the political fallout is only beginning to show. After Democrats swept the state elections in Virginia, New Jersey, California, President Trump admitted the shutdown had hurt his party. Just to quote him here, the shutdown was a big factor, negative for the Republicans, quote unquote. And Trump made that remark, by the way, at a breakfast with GOP senators, where he also complained that the shutdown was hurting the stock market, airlines, the food benefits for low-income Americans. But instead of backing down, Donald Trump has doubled down, it seems. He called on Republicans to end the Senate filibuster, a move that would basically break long-standing legislative norms and let the majority ram through bills. But his call is being met with resistance, as per reports. Senate Republicans, including the majority leader, rejected the idea almost immediately, reportedly. Others warn they may have to revisit it if the shutdown drags on. For now, there is no deal in sight as such. No off-ramp, no sign of relief for the millions of Americans that are caught in this political crossfire. As Trump continues to pressure his own party and the Democrats smell leverage, America remains frozen by the longest government shutdown in its history. Are women safe anywhere? It doesn't look like it. Take what happened with the president of Mexico, the country's highest office, yet even she was not spared. This happened as the president was walking in the streets of Mexico City, interacting with citizens, taking photos, doing what she always does. When a man reached out, tried to kiss her and groped her, the leader turned, clearly shocked, a government official quickly stepped in, placing himself between the president and the man. The man was arrested. The Mexican leader has filed a formal complaint. But the incident has raised disturbing questions. If the president of a country, the president of Mexico, the most powerful woman there in the country, can be assaulted in such a manner in broad daylight, what does that say about every other woman? The president, Mexico's first female president, called it what it was, a crime. She said, I'm quoting here, we cannot let it go as if it were nothing. Although if this happens to a president walking down the street, then what happens to other young women? So we cannot let it go as if it were nothing. So yes, I filed the complaint. It's a written petition submitted to the Attorney General of Mexico City, and I will meet with her to sign it formally before the public prosecutor without privileges, because we cannot let this pass. This is about women's dignity and the recognition of our rights. She filed her complaint without invoking any privileges and said that she will personally sign it before the public prosecutor. The president is known for traveling with minimal security, saying she wants to stay close to the people. She insists that that will not change. But Mexico and much of the world really is outraged. The video of that incident quickly uh, spread across the internet before being taken down by some accounts and for many it symbolized what women face in a society still steeped in uh, such issues especially in Mexico this has sparked nationwide outrage in fact listen to this it's a lack of respect it happens simply because one is a woman and well also to any man but even more so because of the position the president represents even more serious to me, it seems even more serious that in the subway or in any place a woman can be harassed because it happened to me once as a teenager and it's horrible. But back then everyone stayed quiet, nobody said anything and you hid it because you were embarrassed. It's something very common and I think it should stop being normalized. We need to report that this is not okay. It's not okay for someone to touch us and that they feel that just because we're walking on the street they can touch our bodies. That's not okay. 
realmente sorprendente que sucede. Surprisingly, this happens. So carefree that it happens. I think it's more a matter of controlling the narrative and showing that even the president of this country is not free from harassment or altercations. If that happens to a president, what could happen to someone who is here? Activists say this incident is a wake-up call. But they're also pointing fingers at the president herself, accusing her of not doing enough to combat violence against women. Mexico recorded 821 femicides in 2024, 501 more by September this year. Numbers that advocates say are likely underestimated. And all of this comes amid heightened national tension after the assassination of uh, the uh, mayor, Carlos Manzo, uh, prompting the leader to announce a new security strategy focused on justice and social development. But the question still is, if even the president of Mexico can be groped in public, what hope do ordinary women have in a world that still treats them as easy targets?